will be joining us in... Uh, I, I just joined Desmond, sorry. Thanks. Okay. Okay. I think maybe Yababel can, can pro proceed. Thanks, awesome. So, in my window, I see only... Uh, okay, so we are... What you want, great. Um, so I'm just going to plug my computer. Just give me one minute. Okay, now it's done. So, how um, can I get um, there a few texts? that summarizes because sorry i was not there in the morning session but if you could tell me at the end how was your first week in terms of the challenge uh, was that clear you know what was what should we make it clear today like so what do you wanna what do you think is one thing that we can make it clearer better than last week in terms of detailing uh, the challenge. So while I'm just sharing my screen, please keep sharing. Yeah, go on, William. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, one question has been asked, and I think a lot of us have the same uh, uh, question. It was asked by Salam uh, earlier in the morning. Uh, uh, there was uh, a grade given uh, on the interim report uh, or interim submission regarding uh, pipeline uh, uh, usage, uh, but uh, it's not clear for most of us we, uh, how. We, we could have used the pipeline. I um, by the second package uh, before the first submission, that means on task one. Uh, so, how was that? How was the grade given? Okay. And if you can give us, uh, in general, uh, what pipeline means, because uh, it's my understanding that pipeline is basically the uh, learn feature we use to uh, link chain of uh, process in order to the data machine learning uh, prediction algorithms. So. Uh, how did you do the data cleaning uh, and uh, other processes, pre-processes pre that come before uh, uh, this stage? Yeah. Okay, great. I will uh, just try to share my screen. And it's my brother saying, not helping, but just give me one minute. Um, Okay, let me at least this one. Sorry, I have to probably quit my browser and coming back. So it might be there might be an interruption. Just uh, to let you know. I'm probably able to share a window now. Okay. 
Okay, so you are able to see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen now. Okay, so I, uh, I have heard, um, yeah, so do we have another hand? Okay, so in terms of the pipeline, I think your understanding is correct. And if there are any issues in the grid, we definitely will go back and correct as well. Uh, in particular, for the final, there shouldn't be any concern. So I think the pipeline is exactly that. If you have used, uh, if you have chained your code using Scikit's pipeline, or if you have developed your own version, way of chaining things, that means like you take the inputs, so you break apart your code in such a way that you are joining them through let's call a wrapper, and that wrapper could be a psychic wrapper, that wrapper could be, you know, many things, but as long as it could be just in you know, a type of class that you create in such a way that you give it a class and it is instantiated and does that. So the whole point is to be able to break apart codes, to write them independently, expecting a certain form of that, for example, if it's a class, you know, when it's called, it knows what it does, whatever, or and then they have a wrapper that just does all this pipeline. Now, if you wanna, like you will have either a configuration file or something in the front that would be able to, you tell it what would be the pipeline of the current run or like to go to the end, right? So you just tell it, okay, you know, do this one, fetch this data for first and then um, kind of pre-process or kind of filter and feel missing values and then kind of do that and then model and output and write the, the file. So, or maybe you might add, okay, in the middle, if I ask you, or if I hypothetically assume you want to add a new type of pre-processing, that pre-processing could be like, let's say, you want to split the data into uh, something, like into, let's say, training and, and taste. And now you can write an independent code and you add it in the pipeline and then that pipeline will be like that. So as long as you have done that, I think you basically understood well. Is that, is that, is that clear, Inyam? Yeah, it's clear. Okay. So if we have seen, I think in the code, if you have used Python pipeline, uh, uh, scikit pipeline, sorry, um, then you should get that. So there, there shouldn't be, you know. So when we say no use, maybe, it's just in the grading, then it must be due to that, one didn't use um, the, the pipeline, either scikit pipeline or uh, wrapper of some sort. Okay. Okay. So with that, let's continue again. Make it, make it very tight, or you know, raise your hand so that we get a clear understanding of what is. Um, what you know just at the veteran session all the time just the session on monday is to make sure that we went through the challenge and everybody has you know maybe not a deep understanding but a really a clear understanding there, there isn't at least like an obvious you know what is what are we gonna what are we supposed to do kind of question okay so um okay now with that, let's continue. So the current week, you will be doing um, a hypothesis testing, and it will be, it will have a lot of, basically I would say 60% uh, of the work is a lot more on the setting it up, right? In terms of the MLOBS uh, kind of setup. So that means that you should be able to know what means a data drift what means um, kind of data version, what means model version, and what means a code version. You already know code version, but sometimes you might not know why, you know, it's like when in a, in a current industry now, there are gonna be a lot more innovations coming. And a lot of the innovations, a lot of the billion dollars are being invested along the line of pipelines for AI and ML uh, models management. So there is a management element of it. That means, you know, how do you know when a model stops working? You know, how do you manage it? How do you version it? That means like, you know, how do you incrementally improve it? How do you go back 
to the previous model that was performing well, how do you compare it? And the same is data, because models depend on data. And the same is like, you probably need to version data. So there is, of course, the whole concept of the data warehouse, which is in the data engineering that we would be, you know, we would be dealing with. But beyond that also, even for a model, given that you are still pulling it with a certain query or a certain kind of uh, data, especially when something is live online learning, the current challenge is a lot more about that, which is like data is coming and you're trying to auto automate the kind of decision because the data is coming, you can assume that the data is coming with the money that you're paying. So for each data, you are paying money. And of course, when you do that, you want to stop at a very, you know, maximize, just minimize the amount of money that you pay. But of course, maximize the confidence that you have to reach a confidence. Normally, this AP, AB testing in a website or, you know, it's whatever, it's just that you have alternative scenarios that you have, you are not sure whether one is good, one is better or the other. And the only way, of course, to do it in a systematic and a scientific way is to be able to test it. And how do you test it? Usually by showing it for, it could be to customers, if it's a website, if it is, let's say, a feature in your website, uh, by opening it in, in terms of like uh, into multiple um, branches, in, into multiple pipelines. So if a person comes in to buy, then sometimes you show them this, sometimes you show them some that. And the current challenge is just similar, but for an ad campaign, right? So it will be an advertiser company that would be interested, of course, to measure it is ads that it is showing on behalf of a customer, uh, whether their ad has actually an impact, you know, compared to no ad. Of course, we think there is, but we want to test that. And that's the main challenge. But as I said, the setting it up and understanding uh, because the data is small, but understanding the, the flow and the, the kind of the setup is the, the key component as well. Okay, so the overview you probably would know it's a, it's a measurement. Um, so measuring the impact of a certain action, in this case, uh, showing an ad uh, to users and whether those users uh, who has seen the ad actually um, are aware more aware and so that the question that we want to ask them is very simple it is like there is a brand that with this company uh, what we call just a hypothetical name it's called smart ad okay the smart ad company uh, has already is already displaying on behalf of a brand called lux and um, it is showing a, a campaign no, it's, it's showing an ad and then we want to know if people who have seen it are, are aware of the brand better than the people who have, who have not seen it. It seems obvious, but it's not, right? Because you, you, you see so many ads already um, in the wave, and which ones do you actually know? Like, you know, it's kind of, you basically know very, very few of them. Of course, if you see Coca-Cola, because you drink Coca-Cola, you probably would know. But now this brand wants to be known or it wants to improve itself, you know, the, brand awareness, so we want to measure that one. Like, and the all one way to measure it is because the other company, the Smart Ad, which has run the ad campaign, uh, basically said like, the people who have seen our ad, because our ad is designed so nice, that the people who have seen our ad are more likely to know your, your brand better than people who haven't seen it, right? So you basically are querying that, and then the user, uh, users basically say yes and no, and that's the data. And But the thing is, you want to classify the people who have seen already the ad that was displayed by the smart ad versus the people who haven't seen it or who have seen some other ad. So that's why there is in this A-B testing, like always, there is the two, the, the two groups. One is called a, a control group. That means people who have not been treated. In this case, treatment means that people who have seen that and then exposed means like people who have been exposed to that that means who are treated right so so the control is the one who hasn't seen so that means they are your benchmark you're basically saying okay the general population who sees an ad but who has not seen the smart ad ad right 
So while the exposed ones are basically just the ones that who have seen, who have been targeted already um, by this one, okay? And the data that we collect, of course, for this is that it has the option ID, that means at the user level that the people, you know, that you showed something. Um, so that's like an identifier, just basically an identifier of a user. And then an experiment is just a group which if the person, if the person that's targeted, if they have already seen the previous ad that was run by smart ad, then it's called, yes, um, you know, they, it's basically becomes, they are exposed. If they weren't, if they are from the general population, that would be the control. Okay, and then the date, the hour, the device they used to see the ad, whether it's, you know, a Samsung or something, and then the OS, and then a browser that they used. And then yes, say no. If yes means like, um, if the user chooses the yes one from this question, right? Do you know the brand flex? Okay, so, so far, I just want to understand if there is any misunderstanding or if, there, if someone is, can, because I used a lot of words, so sometimes it may be confusing, but is there any question so far with that? Everything clear? If it's clear, just type also just clear. Let me get three clears and then I can proceed. Awesome. Okay. So um, that's the data. You know, it's basically just uh, you will download. Uh, the one thing that will be added here is that I will add actually tomorrow another data. Um, that data is exactly the same. So actually, I would do it on Wednesday. That would be you developed this tool or whatever you're going to develop. But then you will be able to run because the data will be identical. But you will be able to run on that data, the unseen data that assumes, you know, you, you're experimenting with this, whatever. But now I want to say like, oh, I have also another client who wants to do the same, to apply uh, the same thing, like your algorithm or whatever you have developed and to test it on another data. So I will add another data on Wednesday so that whatever the tool that you have developed will be also applied on that. So your final result would be like, you would be summarizing for this, but also everything that you have developed should work for another data. So that means it should be data independent, like where it comes from. It just should be like, there should be a repository that you would have, it's just a change of folder. So nothing should be um, kind of very hard coded for a particular data. It should be modular, okay? So for that reason, there is one data that I'm gonna also add on Wednesday, another data, that has slightly bigger samples. So this one has, I think, 8,000 samples. So control has uh, some, and 4,000, and also exposed as something. So it's slightly smaller. But then we will add something that has something like 100,000 uh, rows, um, which just, you should apply the same thing. Nothing will be different. It's just gonna be the same thing, okay? As usual, as always, of course, in here, a lot more of the thing is, again, continuing from last week, it's about understanding basic statistics, especially uh, statements that you make as a machine learning engineer and also sometimes acting as an analyst. You always are responsible sometimes to make a very sound argument like that. You know, you, 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 can't, just, you can't just be fixing only codes and stuff. Like you are responsible to, for what the code is this, you know, outputting, right? So in that scenario, you will be really needing to understand what it means, this A-B testing, you know, like whether you are a front-end engineer or whether you are uh, um, you know, a machine learning engineer, you need to understand uh, what it, this means fundamental, what, what it means a hypothesis test, what does it mean confidence intervals? What does it mean, you know, when I make statistical measurements, what do I, what does it mean, right? It could be like the speed of my, you know, loading uh, for my website, right? Still, what does it mean that I improved that one? Or it could be just like your code memory usage, right? What does it mean really actually you improve? All of everything, whether it's, you know, pure coding to pure business questions like what we do now, whether there is a significance in terms of people uh, being aware on, on a brand, 
these are all called hypothesis tests that you are testing a certain hypothesis and you want to quantify it. And when you quantify it, you know there is noise in it. And when there's noise, then that means you need to measure the confidence interval. How confident are you that this thing is not a noise? This thing is attributed to what actually you did. Like in this case, for example, a company paid to show an ad, you know, how, you know, what is the kind of like, how much of the brand awareness or the, you know, people being aware on, on the brand, how much is increased because the company puts the money to this particular ad uh, campaign versus completely something else, right? It could be like the company was doing, let's say, radio um, uh, advertisement. Maybe they had also some something that is in the kind of in the post, right? Like, so like those kind of things you want to distinguish so that you can measure particularly the impact of something that you're doing, right? In the website, it's the same. Um, so exactly. So because of that, the statistical modeling and hypothesis testing is really, a, you know, that, that is one. And then using core data, you know, libraries uh, are also one. Definitely, you will, you will think about, you know, this is probably one of the best, for me, one of the best opportunities that you would be able to come to see on overall how similar statistics, machine learning, and deep learning are. In a way, it's just a way of rotating things. So, for example, this is a very suitable for a lot more for statistical modeling because you are, you're sensitive into the error. But then we will also ask you down to turn the same question, the same problem into a machine learning problem. And that way you will be able to see how you turn something that, you know, the, the phrasing of the question, you know, how, how you do it, you know, uh, in, in, in machine learning or as a statistical problem, as a statistical modeling problem, or as a deep learning model uh, problem as well. So it's basically, you'll be able to see the overall, maybe not, you know, you might not understand the full context, but it's something that is really um, good that you, you focus on that as well. So that would be something that you will add on your skill. And then of, but the most important element, as I said, is the model management, building ML catalog, contains model feature levels and training model version. It's basically hyperparameter tuning, all that will be the key component. And then also learning about this uh, new type of tools for kind of uh, DVCs, most much more for the data versioning. And CML, we use it much more of like well, in the CD or CI, uh, basically the continuous integration and continuous deployment, where you will be able to uh, add. So in the normal um, CI, CD, what you have is that unit tests. But the unit tests are as far as like they only test the code. But what about the data? What about the model? What about the accuracy of the model? Because yeah, sure, the code works, the model is produced and everything is fine. But what if the accuracy of the model is not good? What if the data has been drifted, you know, that yes, the columns, whatever structures are correct, but it's actually the topic has moved, right? So how do you know, how do you communicate? How do you do the same thing as like, you know, uh, continuously integrating while making people aware what happened in those elements as well, in the space of code as well, in the space of data, in the space of model. And usually the answer for that is that the pull requests will have an out, will run an automatic analysis and attach a report that shows, let's say, an accuracy of the code, the accuracy of the model, as well as also the kind of the, the topic or the context of the data, whether it's moved, you know, drifted or not. So that kind of things playing with your CI, in this case, GitHub, um, using an automatic report generation, it's CML, and then ML flow is just basically whatever you are producing artifacts will be in your, like needs to be saved, models need to be versioned, and the search spaces, whatever you have done while exploring needs to be saved and accessed later, that's what ML flow is one tool that we will use in this one, okay? And in terms of knowledge, I think all of this is mapping, it's the same, key dates, basically as usual as last time. The only thing is that every communication happens in Slack channel all week too. And interim submission is exactly like Wednesday last time and final submission is like last time Saturday um, corresponding, okay? And leaderboards are computed. Uh, the 30 points will be for 
presentation and reporting because there is a lot of understanding that needs so that's why they took this time uh, it has 30 points and the 12 points will be in the entry so we have asked two questions in task 1.1 answering them it's a lot more of statistical understanding just read more about them there are references for that it's easy and then uh, statistically varied interpretation from task one two that you will see that also is carried and then of course evidence of clear understanding of the business context and model in every time you write something you report something even if it's a one page even if it's a one paragraph always start from motivating why you are doing what you're doing why it's important right that means that, that you understand the importance so even if like it, it's not asked anywhere whatever you do i would say start from always summarizing what even it can be one line or you know one paragraph summarize what are you doing why is it important that you are doing it? so they, that is very you know that needs to be very clear all the time so in your head always when you start assume that somebody will read it and even if that person is the exact same person who gave you the problem they would be happier to start reading about your understanding your version or if they don't know about the project you're like basically you are explaining to them about why what you're doing what is what is the business context what is what is the really the the, the real why should i continue why should i look at the next slides or the next pages of the report so that's really is important and then also every time end with something that is like especially it's in the middle of a project show a, a certain plan okay we have did like that means you summarize i've done we have done so far this and we are remaining to do xyz right so always it doesn't matter whether we write it or not whether we clearly ask or not we we try to do that but make sure that you have this kind of you present in a some way that what you're doing and in some way summarizing where you are and what you're going to do next this is just going to be super useful all the time okay and okay and then the 80 points of course is just that we encourage you that you write this thing as a report and the process that you followed you know all of the this these things are just complex you're you're getting really in the territory of now like whatever in every company people are doing so it's better of course to narrate your understanding even your challenge so that you put it in, in, in a post, either in LinkedIn or Medium, such that first it will be a, a reference to yourself later, but also, you know, you basically get, uh, start learning how to communicate your challenge, your achievements, and, um, and also whatever you learned to the public, okay? So that's for that one, we will have that. This will increase over time, uh, but we really strongly, strongly encourage. Um, and then the quality, of course, is usually just you know your default needs to be improved basically just that's what it means that means whenever you i think most of you have have now a good style a good report in a sense that you you use um some kind of templates that's nice and the fonts similar so slightly better but always keep improving of course to make sure that you know you don't have unnecessary images unnecessary styles you know that will clutter the space Content, you know, style is to help the content be understood well, not to become a content itself. So sometimes I think I've seen a few where the style becomes the content itself. That's not, I mean, that would be really, that shouldn't be the case. The style is to help the content, uh, you know, and, and ease the communication, okay? And then also all the time, of course, if you have time, think about how you kind of summarize things um, and and also just basically that you communicate in a certain voice. Like, are you communicating, you know, like this using the same type of voice or are you changing? Like, I have done that, we have done that, uh, one can do that kind of thing. Like, in a way, these are changing the different type of voices or past, present, for example, say like, I have done that, I will do that, but still within the same, let's say, for the thing, for the same thing that you have done, if you are changing past tense, present tense, that's also sometimes confusing. It's if you keep using something similar voice and uh, that's helpful. Of course, for a future work, you can use a future one, but for the tasks that are done, you can either think of as past days, that means something has been done, 
or as if like you are actually doing it. So you are sitting on each word and explaining as if it's being done, as if this was written while you were doing it. So, but keep, whichever it's fine, but keep using similar, you know, similar voices, I mean, similar articulations and it helps. And then we also just to make sure that you don't, you know, you don't have too much freedom such that, you know, at least uh, there are basic elements that needs to be there in every report or slide. That's the objective of the project, the data size, you know, the method, uh, details on pipeline, uh, whatever used automation. If there are results in discussion and summary, exactly what I said now as just that we expect those sections in the presence of those sections will be also um, uh, you know, put that way. And the 20 points this time is entirely dedicated to the code data and model versioning. So that basically means that we need to see evidence of a functional DVC. That means like whatever you have done, you know, you basically will have screenshot showing that you, you have a data version and that you have put it. And then the same is uh, evidence of functional ML flow model versioning. This you will basically run it in your, all, all of them you will, you will not use in, they will not provide any cloud. So you'll be doing it in your computer, in your laptop. So you will basically set it up and finally you will have basically local host deployed uh, ML flow that contains basically some of the artifacts. And all the time when you give us some, some form of that kind of evidence as a screenshot, please make sure that you, co you kind of take more screenshots, not less, in a sense that that shows, you know, that, that you understood, you're understanding, because it's as if that you are presenting that to us and explaining it to, to us. So, you know, pay attention that you just don't give only one window because that, with that, we don't know whether you understand a bit detail or not. So try to give a bit more uh, screenshot that, that shows different things. And then again, also in, in Git, so at least that you have tried and there is some kind of same mail setup or the same mail um, uh, file like that would do uh, in the repo. And then also that you have actually used it in one case, at least as a PR, in one PR, uh, when you use the CML reports, like when we see that the PR they have requested that automatic CML reports included, that will have this value as well. And then because also this thing, as I said, you want to deploy it somewhere else as a PIP, for example, for future requirements. So that means it should be like self-containable. That means we require that you actually get the, not everything that is unnecessary, all the necessary things that is relevant for the, your package or for your code to so for someone to create environment variable and run your code must be in the requirements. And then as a PIP installable to do it, you know, set it up like um, write basically prepare a setup.file for that. If you do that, you have also points, three points for that. And then you need test coverage and GitHub actions with CICD deployment. Also you have points for that. And then the 30 points, uh, for the final one is basically, I mean, the 30 points for the actual modeling. So it's divided into 12 points for entry. Um, so that means entry usually is on Wednesday. So the entries are the report. There's only two entries. One is the report, which has 12 points and one uh, entry for code that has also 12 points. And in that one is that we expect that you actually always start from a design, you know, how it's gonna be your ML pipeline looks like just so anything that evidence that you have, it could be just a screenshot um, or it can be a report, part of your report that if there is a mail pipeline design that you have done, okay, I'm gonna put this thing in, in here, here is the uh, feature store and it's gonna be my database or here's gonna be my, you know, I'm gonna put dump the files there and I'm gonna like just basically some kind of, um, you know, diagram design like of your, how things will work uh, that will have that point. And then of course your EDA and GitHub readme and other documentation that you will have will have three points and the modularity and quality of your foot, as well as also if you are keep using some, some kind of pipeline approach, you will get also for that one. And then for the final one is 18 points and you will basically have implementation of all the required ML models will have 10 points. And then the screenshot of hyperparameter tuning, not just the screenshot of the ML flow, but that you have done some kind of hyperparameter and that the different those hyperparameters you have shown it in ML flow will have four points. And then of course, advanced GitHub use, that means you are planning things in projects, issues, branches, whatever of GitHub. 
um, you will also get some value, okay? And as always, as last time, visualization, quality of code, innovative approach, writing and presentation, and most supportive in the community will have badges. And this time, you will be doing it in groups. So it's not an individual project. Of course, you have to submit individual ones, individual work, especially report must be individual. Uh, the GitHub, you could create uh, your own kind of organization, but also you can fork it from one group, but it must be in, in your, that you must be as part of a collaborator and you must be, it must be some in your, um, let's say in your GitHub page because so that we can analyze it, okay? But you can, if you create for the group an organization, then you can also submit all of you that, but if it is, for example, let's say in AMAL, and if all of you, you did it in AMAL's uh, space, that won't happen. You must fork it and, and just you at least has to submit the forked version, okay? Um, so if it's organization, it's fine. But if it is an individual workspace, you must all, and it must all show that you have contributed. You have created a branch, you have been added as a contributor, uh, or that in in your, when we look at the Git's uh, submit commit history, we must be able to see your name. Like, that's how we know. Or that your, your contribution must clearly be put somewhere. Uh, you know, maybe in the readme, who contributed what. Okay, so at least there has to be some clarity. Um, so, but you all work in a group because there are a number of things. So you can do it parallelly and set it up parallelly. Come together, discuss and plan. Someone can do, for example, the same mail, and then they can say, like, I have finished now. We can all use it, and then everybody tries that, right? So that's like because it's a number of tasks. So you can parallelize, and that's why it's a group. And also, just how to work in a group is an important criteria. So that's that's the case. So you know in which group you are. So for example, group one will be this one, okay? Like that, so you, you guys um, connect. Okay, so before we now go to instruction, do we have any other? Uh, we have some kind of question. Can you elaborate more on the control and expose term? Okay, and then I think more than 50% of the users didn't answer either yes or no. So how could we align to that? That's that's the thing, right? So like, so in control exposed in the work is that it's really a matter of like, so it's always to say something is significant, we must find something that is neutral. Basically our zero, it's called benchmark. What's our benchmark? You know, let's imagine the economy of, you know, Ghana has, uh, grew, grown this year by 20%. But, you know, this statement must have a reference. What was the benchmark that was used? Was that the benchmark from last year? Most of the time it's from compared to last year. Or it could have been oh, over the, the whole year or over the best year compared to any best year that Ghana had, you know, maybe 20% over that. So the statement itself doesn't tell you. There must be some kind of benchmark. Most of the time that benchmark is, you know, known um, implicitly because it's usually measured like, for example, uh, today's much hot, like, you know, quite hot, then I'm, people would understand compared to probably this year and compared to probably yesterday, you know, compared to maybe last week. So these are kind of unknown. In the statistical terms, we have to be very clear what actually is the benchmark. So, con and then the benchmark is important because if, if you choose, you know, like as uh, earlier I said, Ghana has grown this year by 20%, but if we actually chose the year of COVID time, that was 2020, where the, actually the, you know, all of the economy in the world has shrinked a lot, let's say Ghana, Ghana's economy, let's imagine, was shrinking 20% during Corona time. Now, if, the, if it has increased over the Corona 20%, overall, actually, Ghana hasn't increased at all, right? With respect to like what it was before Corona, because it's just only balanced it. So that's really what it means. Like the benchmark, statistically, when you measure something, unless by, by if you don't define the benchmark well, 
you can cheat. That's why it's called you can lie with statistics because by just changing your benchmark, you could always find something something significant, right? So you could always find something like, oh yeah, the brand is very aware. People are aware. If you are asking people who really actually don't know any brand, while you ask for your for your exposed group, you ask like really uh, very well versed people who actually are aware of brands by just doing that. But it doesn't tell you whether your ad works or not. What you want is whether your ad actually makes a difference, right? So that's what your interest. So in that case, exposed means the one that you treated. So the usual this treatment and not treated comes from the medical side. So you know when a new drug comes in, when a new medicine, usually it's tested whether it has an impact, and that is controlled by like you know taking people, for example, uh, sick people uh, of that same condition, and then you split them into two or something. Let's say, and one you call them like those who takes the medicine. And once who takes something else that they are told, maybe, I don't know, it's a medicine, it's called placebo, they take the placebo. And now you would compare. So the ones that, what you want is that both are in everything the same, identical. Of course, there are people, they can't be identical, but in principle, statistically, you want them to be identical in everything except the things that you are changing. In this case, the things you are changing is that these people, the exposed people will take the medicine. The other ones don't. And then you try to measure whether the medicine has impact statistically. You know, that's what is the COVID vaccination was done. Everything is done like that in medical world, as well as also it's very common A-B testing for website optimization. You know, should we add the, should we change the color? Should we add the button? Should we increase this or that? It's called A-B testing. It's everywhere. It's, um, you would do it. That's why it's an important thing. So hopefully in the work that this answered your question. Um, so yeah, it's basically, it's as I said, it is uh, the people who haven't seen the ad, they are asked it as a control. So we, of course, just for the sake of, as I said earlier, to make them identical in everything, except that in, in our case, it's about the people who have seen the ad or the people who haven't seen the ad. Just for that reason, we also show the people who haven't seen the ad, some kind of another ad, our own, but some, some ad, not the, the, the brand Lex, but let's say just another random brand. Right, and then we ask them like, okay, all of them now in, in this case are the same. That means they come to the internet, they check websites, they have similar property. Because if we don't do that, maybe we might be targeting people who don't actually click on that. But we need because in this case, the the both groups control and and uh, uh, expose. They must be from the same population. We treat them the same in everything, except only we vary only one thing. In this case, that right. So that's why we identify them and we show them that. And, and so they become, you know, we don't show them what we want, but they are shown something else. And then they become our control. Just like a placebo. Basically, these people are given something, but that something is a placebo, not the actual medicine or the actual uh, in this case. So yes, uh, Michael, that's exactly the, the question. Most of the time, you, you, in, in your in real world, that is the kind of cases that you would happen. You can't control you have to deal with it so of course you may drop it you know most likely you may drop it you may see and you might see okay what can i use it for like okay 50 percent of it they, they haven't clicked so that means what can i use it for maybe is this so usually it's called in a b testing you can you must taste the similarity of the people so that means for example out of the 50 percent if they are equal like let's say 40 percent of them are the people who haven't seen the ad then you, this will tell you, the, out of the 50% who hasn't answered, if 40% from the control are from the control group, then you might say like, oh, like, you know, maybe that there is an error because it doesn't seem the two groups are similar because the two groups, the two groups must answer similarly, must have similar properties. So you must check that they have similar OSs. Like there isn't that systematic difference between them. So you may use that part for your it's called um uh, metric like for basically uh the to to measure that the data quality that this is okay you know so you can always use it for different purposes hopefully that's clear now michael 
No, I think everything must be done in one repo. I mean, I mean, within a group, you can choose to, to do it in different repo. Um, or, and, and then you basically just basically pull a request from here to there. It's your choice, but ultimately everybody has to submit. If it's not, if you haven't created an organize your own Git organization to work for that, you must submit your own, just a repository from your, um, from your account, from your Git, GitHub account. Okay. So that means, yeah, you could be working in one repo. You could be developing it separately, but then you can always just be added in one repo as a collaborator and you can pull requests, whatever there. So, yeah. Okay, great. I think I have answered probably all of the questions, right? Is there any question, anything that's not clear? If not, then I will proceed. Okay, so. The objectives are very clear, setting up a B testing framework, setting understanding what it means, repeat, setting up a repeatable ML framework, performing A B testing with classical, sequential, these are statistical, two types of statistical algorithms, and then machine learning methods using ML of uh, best practices, and, and then extract, extracting statistically valid insights from um, that. So you read that one. So the task one is, of course, understanding A B testing framework. Basically, you know, you should, while answering these questions, it will help you to understand, you know, what, what goes into the statistical modeling. Um, and then when you answer the classical and sequential A-B testing analysis, this basically is, you are now, so this is all knowledge related. You know, task one, one is much more of reading, a lot more of reading. Task one, two is implementing what you have read. Uh, we'll provide sequential is a bit involving, we only added it so that you get a certain grasp. Why do people go a long way for a small, for in the classical sense, you might do it in 10 lines of code. In the sequential sense, you might do it, you might probably need thousands of lines. But why do people go that, that way, when you could do it? It's because of, you know, if you want to extract like some uh, accuracy to improve accuracy, sometimes you go a long way. So it's just too short, but mathematically it might be involving. So a lot more take of it as like, we'll give a starter code if it's not already there. Um, a lot more just only understand the concept and run something, but you know, you might not fully understand the sequential uh, because it has a lot of conceptual uh, understanding needed. So ask a lot of questions, try, uh, but don't spend too much time trying to solve uh, sequential. It's the, as long as you understand what it means, why it's there, and just you run a code that we given that would be sufficient and just the classical ones you know will make it slightly easier and then that's what this part is 1.1 1 .1 class uh, task 1.2 is basically just being able to write the code uh, and run and, and and get some results you know and then in task 2 is basically you are doing it with machine learning but the the switch to machine learning is basically what we call feature importance because now you want there is one feature in the data that feature is called um, as you know that's kind of experiment right so whether the data the row whether that row is from the control or the so it's basically there are only two conditions right whether it's control or uh, exposed so it's basically for half of the data it's going to be experiment and uh, exposed and the other it would be control you will be able to see if that being in that class as a kind of classification based meaning that class has actually importance so you would turn it you would turn this a b testing statistical thing into machine learning using uh, feature importance so that's what's like it's kind of given here uh, but again while doing that you will basically be doing ml setup that will come very handy for future projects as, as well so it's a very simple thing it's just you'll you'll probably run you know, decision trees, logistic regression, and XGBoost. And you're gonna actually, I think, I, instead of decision trees, um, let me add actually, random forest is really key. So let's say, I think the easiest is, and then at least I will highlight what are the three key bold ones here.
So at least those ones you can skip or include decision trees as well. But this is basically doing that. Okay. And then task three is basically uh, interpretation and reporting. Okay. And then as usual, it's basically the overview, uh, the schedules, the tutorials, and but in this case, I have put a number of references in particular for each of them by section. So start from there and definitely of course you can add your own uh, things but a number of uh, good references are there so hopefully it will, it will make you so but one person shouldn't read everything because there are a lot what you should do is that distribute and concur that means people read and come together you know in a, you can have once or twice a meeting a google meet in uh, within your group and then discuss what you have read for example and then getting you know get most of the papers rate by team members and and then them they can give you like the summary of that so that you can understand okay so that way so no i think uh for all of the cases we are we are actually in one week there is only one repo you did yeah so in a way i it is conceptually uh, the same that like you are operating it on one data so it's not that different even if you are running it on ml you know like whatever the setup and the the thing you, it can be in one repo so do it all in one repo it, it helps so all this will be in one repo but then next time of course you can pull some of the things to be another repo if you want you can also make it a sub repo so it's called a sub module and git if you want to, so that you can use the email, whatever setup for future as well as a sub module, if you are interested. Okay. But I think one repo would, would help us would definitely be important for us, especially as you know, that we are automatically kind of computing uh, some metrics from, from your, from your Git repo. Okay. Is that clear? Um, you, yeah, I, I mean, I would, I would imagine, sure, from practical perspective, yes, but I would imagine if you are in a group to start everything as one, so not as task one, task two, whatever, sequentially, but actually be able to start operating in all of them at the same time, especially like DVC, data versioning, you know, um, and also just uh, PR, request using cml and ml flow you know even for ml flow you don't have to just go to a uh, machine learning even for your classical test you should be start using if you can with ml flow so i would say setting up the environment first will help but of course because we don't want you to be like on wednesday without understanding the topic we made it we made sure that your submission uh, is uh, your interim submission is more about conceptual element at first but ultimately it's the structuring sometimes means we want to make sure that people understand before you know so but it doesn't mean time wise you also have to structure it that way sometimes sometimes it's beneficial to set up a base from where you can use the whole time so yes you can do that Iridia, but it's probably also better to set it up like you know parallel i hope that's clear awesome okay so any other question if not we will then continue as usual in slack and um, read it get in a group you know have a meeting really soon i would say in the next an hour or so whenever it's convenient within your group so that you can discuss the role you know who's doing what and overlapping and kind of specially reading and concurring. Okay. So make strategies and, and I think it will be fun. And a lot of concepts, you know, one of the thing about hypothesis testing is that it's the simplest concept, but it's the hardest concept because it's the simplest in terms of, it seems something that, you know, but when you do it, it gets a little bit complex because, ah, uh, you know, it's the real statistics, basically. Whatever you hate about statistics isn't there. 
uh, sample population all of this the basic basic part of statistics is there and i would say it's a very good time to be able to have a certain grasp of like what do we mean what this you know uh, population you know drawn from a population it's a sample sample mean you know a bias variance all of that is kind of a good time to start grasping it you may not fully understand will not have time but no they didn't answer means they have seen it but they just disable they have just decided not to answer sure we don't know what it means it is not null zero zero it's usually it's just zero zero uh no null if it is zero zero it basically means they haven't answered because uh, if you think of it there's only it's it's said yes is zero or one no is zero and one so now if both are zero zero it means that they haven't answered they must answer one one of them so it's not null even if both are zero it means null there must be one of them must be one if they have answered so the, so either null or both zero is basically null they haven't answered is that clear yeah okay great yeah okay great the group work is basically just like no it's there's no group work per se it's like you work the whole challenge as a group basically you are now given a chance to share codes within to be able to work within your group and basically if you if you like your report should be yours but the code can be identical you must contribute to it but you can basically you are we're saying like within the group you can have one repository that all can share as long as it shows that you have contributed so it's not about group work it's just that you you solve the whole challenge as a group is that clear this way great awesome wonderful so all questions directed to slack and hopefully everything is just uh, clear yeah it's, it's it's a nice very easy data but number of tasks so the, the, the data is very small but the tasks are more so it's kind of like this is just a uh, fun so happy solving cheers guys and whoever the data science th uh, in the ten academy team you can stop the recording now i think cheers guys bye